In this pre-call talk, we'll cover 12 critical imaging findings you need to be comfortable handling as a radiologist anytime, and especially on call. Critical imaging findings in radiology are imaging findings that may be immediately life-threatening. In these situations, the ordering provider may not be aware of the diagnosis and management of their patient will be acutely affected. Our fear of letting an imaging study with one of these 12 conditions languish on a PAX work list is one of the reasons we try hard to triage work lists appropriately in the reading room and why we monitor turnaround times closely. If you're taking radiology call, you must be comfortable diagnosing these 12 conditions accurately and promptly. Two of these conditions are neurological, three are thoracic, three are vascular, and four are obstetrical. Critical imaging finding number one is severe intracranial mass effect on head CT or brain MR. The skull is a closed, rigid container with several rigid membranes, large folds of dura, the cerebral falx, which descends vertically into the longitudinal fissure between the cerebral hemispheres, and the cerebellar tentorium, which extends over the posterior cranial fossa, separating the occipital and temporal lobes from the cerebellum and infratentorial brainstem. Here are the cerebral hemispheres and the infratentorial brainstem, and here is the cerebellum. Because the skull is a closed compartment, any space-occupying object, such as this mass, may squash and displace all the other soft tissues inside the skull if they occur. Places where tissue can easily get damaged when this happens are along the sharp edge of the cerebral falx, which can result in lower limb paralysis, along the sharp edge of the cerebellar tentorium, which can res result in limb paralysis, loss of consciousness, loss of spontaneous motor function, respiratory compromise, or death, and at the foramen magnum, which can result in loss of consciousness or cardiopulmonary dysfunction. On head CTs, always be on the lookout for intracranial mass effect, like in this example, where mass effect from a hematoma has resulted in brain herniating past the sharp margin of the cerebral falx anteriorly, or in this example, on brain MR, where an infratentorial mass has resulted in severe squashing of the brainstem and cerebellum within the posterior fossa, in addition to herniation past the sharp margins of the cerebellar tentorium superiorly and through the foramen magnum inferiorly. Focal space occupying intracranial conditions that can cause severe intracranial mass effect include intracranial hematomas from trauma, stroke, or any other cause of bleeding, tumors, or cerebral edema in the setting of situations like infection, stroke, or trauma. Severe intracranial mass effect claimed the life of martial artist and actor Bruce Lee. Critical imaging finding number two is acute intracranial hemorrhage on head CT or brain MR. Interparenchymal bleeds can rapidly lead to severe mass effect, as can extraaxial bleeds, such as subdural, epidural, or subarachnoid hemorrhages. On this head CT, a large intraparenchymal bleed has now occupied a great amount of space that would have been occupied by brain inside this closed skull. Acute intracranial hemorrhages can occur in settings like trauma, stroke, aneurysms, and vascular malformations. Bleeds where the source is arterial and blood accumulates under arterial pressures can especially progress and create severe intracranial mass effect at breathtaking speeds. A subdural hematoma from a fall claimed the life of actor and comedian Gary Coleman. Critical imaging finding number three is tension pneumothorax on chest x-ray or CT. Remember that the lung is enveloped by a thin airtight membrane called the visceral pleura, and that the inner surfaces of the rib cage and hemidiaphragm are lined by a thin airtight membrane called the parietal pleura. In a normal state, the lung is fully expanded, 
and the visceral and parietal pleural membranes are closely opposed to each other, making the pleural space in between the two membranes a potential space. In the setting of a penetrating injury to the chest wall, which violates the integrity of the visceral pleural membrane, air inside the lung can begin leaking into the pleural space, driven by a slight pressure gradient between the alveolar spaces at atmospheric pressure and the pleural space, which is at slightly less than atmospheric pressure. As the pneumothorax progresses, the pressures be between the alveolar spaces and the pleural space may begin to equilibrate, and air may flow more freely in either direction past the visceral pleural defect, from lung to pleural space during inspiration, and from pleural space to lung on expiration, and so on. On infrequent occasions, however, the tear at the visceral pleural membrane may occur in such a way that a small soft tissue flap is created which can act as a one-way valve of sorts, allowing a little bit of air to pass from the lung and into the pleural space during each inspiration, but preventing the free return of air from the pleural space back into the lung on expiration. With each respiratory cycle, more and more air is pumped into the pleural space and the pressure within the pleural space begins to rise. At a certain point, the pleural cavity, which is, um, which eventually reaches quite high pressures, may begin to push the mediastinum away. Two large, thin-walled, low-pressure vascular conduits responsible for all blood return to the heart, namely the SVC and IVC, can begin to get stretched and narrowed, and eventually cut off blood return to the heart. No blood return means no cardiac output, which is why tension pneumothoraces are so deadly. Whenever we identify a pneumothorax, such as on the left side of this chest x-ray, we pay very close attention for any evidence of mediastinal displacement away from the side the pneumothorax is on, paying attention to whether midline structures such as the trachea or an NG or OG tube in the esophagus or even the cardiac silhouette are not where they should be. The hope is to intervene on tension pneumothoraces as early as possible and avoid progressions to a situation like this one where a right tension pneumothorax has become quite severe and is now being imaged mid-code. And these are just a few bullet points summarizing what we just covered in the last few slides and images. During the Vietnam War, one out of every three potentially survivable battlefield deaths occurred because of tension pneumothoraces. Critical imaging finding number four is a large pulmonary embolus on chest CT. Large PEs usually occur when a blood clot that developed within a large deep vein in a lower limb gets dislodged, swept downstream by venous blood return, passes through the right heart chambers, and gets lodged within a central pulmonary artery. Large PEs occupy a bit of space within the lumen of the central pulmonary arteries and can partially occlude downstream flow of blood from the right heart chambers into the lungs. Because blood flow through the human body flows in a continuous single circuit, impeding forward flow in any segment of the circuit impedes flow throughout the entire circuit. Since blood flow upstream from the choke point can't move forward, and segments of the circuit downstream from the choke point receive much less inflow. In the setting of a large partially occlusive PE in the central pulmonary arteries, cardiac output falls, and since the amount of blood entering and flowing through the blood through the um, lungs falls, oxygenation decreases too. A large PE was what claimed the life of actor and comedian Gary Shandling. Critical imaging finding number five is cardiac tamponade on chest CT or MR. The pericardial space that surrounds the heart resembles the pleural space that surrounds the lung. Like the pleural space, the pericardial space is a potential space that lies between the visceral serous pericardium, a thin membrane that surrounds the heart, and the parietal serous pericardium, which is a thin membrane that lines the inner surface of a thick sac called the fibrous pericardium. When fluid or blood accumulates within the pericardial space, the fibrous pericardium is able to stretch a little. However, its ability to stretch and accommodate increasing amounts of pericardial fluid is limited, so that any additional pericardial fluid accumulation past a certain point 
will begin to exert mass effect on the heart chambers and affect their ability to expand and accommodate blood return. This condition, where enough fluid has accumulated in the pericardial space to compress the heart, impaired, um, impairing the chamber's ability to fill, uh, leads to decreased cardiac output and shock, and something we call cardiac tamponade, a medical or traumatic emergency. Since the right heart chambers are at lower pressure than the left heart chambers, mass effect will often be worse on the right heart chambers than on the left heart chambers. This is an example of a pericardial effusion with cardiac tamponade on chest CT. The diagnosis of cardiac tamponade is most reliably made on echo. Although large pericardial effusions can result in cardiac silhouette enlargement on a chest x-ray, as an imaging modality, chest x-rays are neither specific nor sensitive for cardiac tamponade. We tend to do a little better recognizing cardiac tamponade on chest CT or MR, where we'll suspect cardiac tamponade when three things are present, a pericardial effusion, central venous distension, and leftward bowing of the interventricular septum. Cardiac tamponade was what claimed the life of astronaut Neil Armstrong. Critical imaging finding number six is aortic dissection on enhanced CT or MR of the chest or abdomen. This is a cross-sectional image of the aorta. The wall of the aorta is composed of three layers. An aortic dissection occurs when blood at arterial pressure within the aortic lumen is able to penetrate the intima through an intimal tear and enter the media. Blood accumulating within the media at arterial pressure rips the media apart along a plane which may continue to expand under arterial pressure, creating a space within the media we call the false lumen that can propagate along the length of the aorta for any distance forward or backward. As blood entering the false lumen increases, the patency of the true lumen may eventually become compromised. The tissue flap separating the false lumen from the true lumen is known as the intimal flap. Here's a longitudinal view of the same process. As you can see, an aortic dissection can propagate into branch vessels and compromise their patency too. If we understand how the plumbing works in an aortic dissection, their appearance on conscious enhanced cross-sectional imaging is pretty easy to understand. Since the aortic wall was not designed to withstand arterial pressure indefinitely, a rupture through the adventitia may eventually occur, resulting in an arterial bleed into the body that can often be fatal. Here's an enhanced axial CT image of a type A dissection and its corresponding coronal image. You can see the intimal flap well, in addition to small intimal calcifications too. An aortic dissection was what claimed the life of actor John Ritter. Critical imaging finding number seven is a leaking aortic aneurysm on CT or MR of the chest or abdomen. Aortic aneurysms occur when a combination of genetic predisposition, stresses within the aortic wall, inflammation, and wall degradation lead to weakening of the aortic wall that permits blood under arterial pressure within its lumen to expand the aorta. Since circumferential wall stress increases as aortic diameter increases, a positive feedback loop develops that drives further enlargement of the aortic um, aneurysm. Eventually, wall stresses within the aortic wall may become too great, leading to loss of wall integrity and an arterial pressure bleed into the body, which has a predictable appearance on contrast-enhanced imaging and can often be fatal. Here's an enhanced CT of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm with hemorrhage throughout the retroperitoneum that displaces the left kidney anteriorly. A leaking aortic aneurysm was what claimed the life of physicist Albert Einstein. Critical imaging finding number eight is a traumatic aortic injury and may be suspected on chest x-ray and diagnosed on CT or MR of the chest. Motor vehicle accidents and falls from significant height are the most common causes of traumatic aortic injuries and occur when the chest traveling at a high rate of speed 
comes to a sudden stop. At the moment this occurs, the ribcage, spine, heart, and diaphragm may come to a complete stop, but the thoracic aorta is still traveling at its original rate of speed, leading to severe shear forces at three points where the thoracic aorta is tethered to structures that have already come to a complete stop. At the aortic root, the ligamentum arteriosum, and the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm. There isn't a lot of soft tissue to temporarily tamponade bleeding from an aortic rupture at the aortic root or the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm, which is why folks with aortic injuries at these two locations usually die in the field and never make it to the trauma bay. There's a slightly higher chance of some temporary tamponading around aortic injuries near the aortic isthmus, which is why some patients with this type of traumatic aortic injury may sometimes make it to the trauma bay and actually get imaged. Here's an MPR of a traumatic aortic injury near the isthmus. The focal bulge of the aortic contrast pool here corresponds to a pseudoaneurysm at the site of a temporarily contained aortic bleed in addition to a large left hemothorax. Here's another axial enhanced chest CT image from a traumatic aortic injury case where the injuries include a pseudoaneurysm where the aortic rupture is temporarily being contained, a focal traumatic aortic dissection, a large diffuse mediastinal hematoma, and a left hemothorax. This is the patient's corresponding chest x-ray, which showed a highly suspicious, abnormally widened mediastinum and a partially imaged left apical pleural cap corresponding to a left hemothorax. A traumatic aortic injury was what claimed the life of Princess Diana. Critical imaging finding number nine is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy on pelvic ultrasound CT or MR. Severe life-threatening intra-abdominal bleeding may occur in the setting of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And not all ectopic pregnancies are caught on ultrasound imaging. In this particular patient, the diagnosis was actually made on abdominal CT. So please remember to keep ectopic pregnancies in mind when you're reading any abdominal CT of a woman of childbearing age. Critical imaging finding number 10 is a large placental abruption on pelvic ultrasound, CT, or MR. Placental abruptions are uncommon, but occur when the placenta partially or completely detaches from the inner wall of the uterus before delivery. Not only does this severely compromise the amount of oxygen and nutrients supplied to the fetus, it may result in uncontrolled bleeding in the mother that can be life-threatening. On this transabdominal ultrasound image, a hypochoic and heterogeneous mass corresponding to a retroplacental hematoma is present between the placenta and the uterine wall. Note that ultrasound is relatively insensitive for placental abruptions, which means some cases may not be caught on ultrasound. As a consequence, patients are often treated if clinical suspicion alone is high. Critical imaging finding number 11 is a fetal biophysical profile score of 2 or less on fetal ultrasound. The fetal biophysical profile is a non-invasive assessment usually performed after week 32 of pregnancy in high-risk pregnancies to assess the well-being of the fetus and for fetal asphyxia. Five items are assessed during the fetal biophysical profile. Fetal reactivity, fetal breathing, amniotic fluid volume, fetal tone, and fetal movement. Depending on what's observed, a score of 0 or 2 is assigned for each of the five categories, and the five scores are then summed. Scores of 10 and 8 in the setting of normal amniotic fluid volume are considered normal and require no intervention. Lower scores correspond to progressively higher suspicion for fetal asphyxia and may require emergent delivery. In order to minimize the possibility of permanent fetal injury, disability, or death. Critical imaging finding number 12 is reversed end diastolic flow on umbilical arterial fetal Doppler ultrasound. 
Recall that normally a single umbilical vein supplies oxygen and nutrients from the placenta to the fetus and two umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta. It's abnormal, particularly after 16 weeks gestation, to see blood flow in the umbilical arteries go both ways, reversing direction at end diastole. Reversal of end diastolic flow is very worrisome for fetal mortality. The first sign of an abnormality is loss of the end diastolic component of the Doppler waveform within an umbilical artery due to increasing placental insufficiency and increasing resistance within the placental vascular bed. As placental insufficiency worsens, the end diastolic component of the waveform disappears and can even be reversed, appearing below the baseline, as in the Doppler tracing example on the right side of this slide. So, whether you're taking radiology call or not, as radiologists, we must always be comfortable diagnosing these 12 conditions accurately and promptly. Not only must they be diagnosed promptly, direct verbal reporting within or the direct uh, verbal reporting with the patient's provider is crucial, as missed or delayed diagnoses can have major consequences. Your notification responsibilities in these settings is usually to contact the response provider as soon as possible, and no more than 30 to 60 minutes after the result is known. Use two patient identifiers to ensure everyone's talking about the same patient and the appropriate patient, and make sure that the referring provider verbalizes the findings back to you in order to ensure that they heard your message accurately. After you've spoken to them, document, document, document. Be sure to include who you spoke to and when you spoke to them. 